We're continuing our study of the books of history. The books of history are 12 in number. They cover about 1,000 years of Israel's history. And they cover the history from their, Israel's history from the time of the conquest up into the rebuilding of the wall following the Jews' return from the Babylonian captivity. We've already examined three of these 12 books. We've examined the book of Joshua that tells us about the seven years that Israel took to conquer the land of Canaan. And then we've examined the book of Judges that uh, tells us about the 350 years during which the children of Israel rule by a series of judges. We also examined the book of Ruth, a beautiful book of light in the midst of 350 years of darkness. The period of Judges ended when the children of Israel asked for a king. And uh, this was a mistake on their part. God told them they shouldn't. Kings would mistreat them, but they insisted. And so God gave them Saul, who ruled for 32 years. And we read about his reign in the book of 1 Samuel. Now, following Saul, there will be David, and we'll read about his reign in 2 Samuel. Having said that, however, David appears in 1 Samuel as a boy. So even though if you want to know about his reign as king, you turn to 2 Samuel. If you want to read about uh, his introduction to us as a young boy, you read about that in 1 Samuel. At any event, we're working our way through this book right now. There are a number of issues uh, and events in this book that are worth our time. It opens with Hannah crying out to God for a child. She's the mother of Samuel, and God gave her that wonderful, wonderful son. Then there was, uh, uh, then we examine the story of Samuel growing up with Eli in the tabernacle. And uh, following that, the next subject in the book of 1 Samuel was that of the Philistines capturing the Ark of the Covenant. The children of Israel had no business taking the Ark of the Covenant into battle with the Philistines, but like so many people, they believed in the power of religious relics. I want to drive that point home because it's really kind of disgusting. And that it permeates Christianity is really disgusting. There's no power in relics. In fact, God was so unhappy with them that when they took this religious relic into battle with them, rather than losing 4,000 men in the first battle with the Philistines, they lost 30,000. Big message there. You want trouble? Depend on religious relics. And uh, then we discussed the, uh, and we did this last week, we discussed the subject of Samuel anointing King Saul. He met King Saul while Saul was looking uh, before he was king, when he was looking for some lost donkeys, uh, Samuel saw him. God said, that's the man. And uh, so uh, Samuel anointed Saul king, and then he invited the community of Israel to Mitzvah, where they publicly anointed him. And uh, we'll be discussing this evening the reign of King Saul. And uh, we talked about the anointing last week. Now we're going to discuss his, the man himself and his reign. Guys, can we get this thing to... S it keeps going away. I don't know. Hold on just a minute. These men can do anything. with. See, it just keeps going away. You think Bill Gates would have made better pointers, don't you? Blame it on Bill Gates. I blame everything on Bill Gates. All my inability to do computer work is Bill Gates' fault. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's talk about King Saul and his reign. His reign began well, and it was encouraging. After he had been anointed king by Samuel privately, as pointed out a moment ago, Samuel invited all of Israel to come to Mitzvah, which was just north of Jerusalem. There's Gibeah, where Saul lived, Ramah, where Samuel lived, and then just north of that, a few miles, is Mitzvah. And so Samuel invited all of Israel to come to Mitzvah uh, to anoint their king, their first king. And the first thing they did, uh, Samuel didn't tell them that, that God had already pointed Samuel or, or Saul out to be the first king. He didn't want it to make it appear like it was a stacked deal, like I've chosen my buddy, any of that business. So they, what they did was they brought all the tribes to Mitzvah, and then they cast lots. 
to determine which tribe would supply the first king. And that came up the tribe of Benjamin. And then they cast lots to see which clan and then which family. And the family was the family of Kish. And they kept casting lots. And, uh, and it turned up that Saul would be their first king. And what's interesting about this is that uh, he immediately showed humility. So we're talking about how he began well. He demonstrated humility in that while they were casting lots, even though he knew he, he was going to be the one that would be selected as king, he was hiding among the baggage rather than parading like a peacock, the way some of our politicians would do. Uh, so that it, it, and, and that's a good quality. God appreciates humility. He demonstrated humility right at the very beginning. And by how? By hiding among the luggage. We read about it in 1 Samuel 10. When Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. Then he brought forward the tribe of Benjamin, clan by clan, and Matri's clan was chosen. Finally, Saul, son of Cush, Kish, was chosen. But when they looked for him, he could not be found. So they inquired further of the Lord. Has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, yes, he has hidden himself among the baggage. He was not a braggart. He was not a show-off. He was not a prima donna. And let me emphasize this. God really, really, really dislikes prima donnas and leadership. One of God's great symbols is that of a servant, as an ox, as a servant. If, if you look at God's uh, coat of arms, if you will, and we've discussed this before. We'll be discussing it more as we work our way through. There are four figures on God's coat of arms. One is an eagle, which speaks of God. That's the symbol of God. He flies high where people can't fly. Speaks of his deity. And the second is that of a man because God chose to become a man. He didn't become a mule or a donkey or a giraffe or a lion, any of those things. He became a man. And then the, second, the third symbol on his coat of arms is that of a lion because he wasn't just any man. He was a Jewish man a, uh, a, a, of the tribe of Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. But the fourth symbol in his coat of arms, this has always just delighted me, was that of an ox. Because in antiquity, the ox were the great servants. They were, they were the tractors of the day. These were the power forces. And so basically what God is saying, I am by nature a servant. And when he's looking for good kings, he's looking for servant kings. Keep that in mind when you're in a church and they're selecting a pastor. If he's not going to be a servant, don't hire him. And that should be true in leadership across the board. God expects their leaders not to be prima donnas, but servants. And so I bring this up now because this is very much a part of who God is and what he wants. And we see in Saul, he showed humility right from the get-go, and I'm sure that pleased God. So he demonstrated humility, hid among this, the, uh, these, he hid during the selection process, and he was also silent before his critics. What happened was, after he was selected by Lot, and everyone knew this was from the Lord, because Samuel was there running the whole show, they saw the lots being cast, it wasn't a stacked deck, none of that business, even though God, uh, uh, Samuel already knew that it was Saul, and Saul knew that it was him. God wanted to demonstrate this publicly and openly. They like to use the word transparency a lot in kind of politics, don't they? Well, God actually likes transparency. He likes transparency. He doesn't want to stack deck. We're not supposed to maneuver against each other. And so he wanted everything above board and clean. And uh, so uh, it was all done publicly. But as soon as it was done, some of the folks started criticizing Saul and denouncing him and saying nasty things about him. We read about it in 1 Samuel 10. Saul also went home to Gibeah, accompanied by valiant men whose hearts God had touched. But some troublemaker said, how can this fellow save us? They despised him and brought him no gifts. But guess what? Saul kept silent. He could have criticized them. He could have retaliated. You don't do that to kings in antiquity. This was not a democratic process. So he could have retaliated and he would have had the support for the people, from the people. But he didn't. He kept silent. So what we have is Saul beginning well. He demonstrated humility. He had, during the selection process, he was silent before his critics. He also demonstrated courage and wisdom. And that he demonstrated courage and wisdom when the Ammonites, the, Am the Ammonites were a nation of people who lived just east of, of the northern section of the Dead Sea. The Ammonites traveled about 35 or 40 miles north 
to a Jewish city called Jabesh Gilead. And they laid a siege around Jabesh Gilead. And you all know what a siege is, right? Mostly cities had walls, and they would the, and, and the, the, the enemy army would encamp around the enemy wall, and that's called a siege. They wouldn't let anything go in or come out, which is kind of tough because in time you're not going to have food. And you're not going to be able to trade. So you're sort of stuck inside the city. So the Ammonites, a whole nation, came against one city. They laid a siege around it. Now, the folks in Jabesh Gilead could have mustered up their own little group of, of soldiers and gone out and attacked the Ammonites, but that would have been certain death. So they pleaded with the Ammonites to make a deal. And the Ammonites said, we'll make a deal. Uh, and we'll sign a treaty with you and back off, but we get to gouge out the right eye of, every, right eye of everybody in the city. The folks at Jabesh Gillish didn't much like that idea, as you could imagine. They said, give us seven days, and if uh, nobody comes to our aid, why, well, we'll let you gouge out our eyes. I mean, they didn't have much choice. As soon as Saul heard about this, he was incensed. And he rallied the troops to go and save the folks in Jabesh Gilead from the Ammonites. But that wasn't really an easy task. You've got to remember at this time in history, they'd had 350 years of being ruled by judges. And uh, they were a loose-knit confederation of tribes. They were all Jews. They were all Israelites. They were all uh, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they were a loose-knit confederation, if you will. And Saul knew that just saying, we got to go help him, wouldn't be enough. So what he did was he got hold of two oxen. He had them cut up into pieces. And then he sent those pieces of the oxen throughout Israel to all the 12 tribes and said, I'm going to do this to your oxen if you don't rally to my side and help me knock out the Ammonites. The people bought that. <laughs> so... 300,000 from Judah showed up, or from, from Israel showed up, the northern tribes, and another 30,000 from the southern tribes. You say, well, that seems a little harsh. Folks, this was time to rally the troops and force them to rally. They needed to go and help their brothers. If you're going to have a nation, you've got to have a defense department. And this was a way of forcing them, them to, to rally to help the brothers and sisters at Jabesh Gilead. Read about it. Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to him, Make a treaty with us, and we will be subject to you. But Nahash the Ammonite replied, I will make a treaty with you only on the condition that I gouge out the right eye of every one of you and so bring disgrace on all of Israel. The elders of Jabesh said to him, Give us seven days so we can send messengers throughout Israel. If no one comes to rescue us, we'll surrender to you. Well, Saul threatened, as I just pointed out, the tribes and to coming and helping him save the folks at Jabesh Gilead. When Saul heard their words, the spirit of the Lord came upon him in power and he burned with anger. He took a pair of oxen, cut them into pieces and sent the pieces by messengers throughout Israel proclaiming, this is what will be done to the oxen of everyone who does not follow Saul and Samuel. Then the terror of the Lord fell on the people. So God was clearly in favor of this. You folks, you got to step up and go help. And they turned out as one man. When Saul mustered them at Bezek, the men of Israel numbered 300,000 and the men of Judah 30,000. The next day Saul separated his men into three divisions. During the last watch of the night, they broke into the camp of the Ammonites and slaughtered them until the heat of the day. Those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. So Saul did very well at the beginning. He demonstrated humility. He demonstrated courage and wisdom. To be courageous isn't quite enough. You've got to be a smart general. If I have a general who's courageous but he's stupid, I'm not sure I want to follow him. He, he was wise, and this was totally kosher. And uh, while he was at Gilgal, he he. He was at Gilgal, the, the uh, well, we'll talk about that in a moment. And finally, he demonstrated nobility. The people then said to Samuel, Who was it that asked, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring these men to us, and we will put them to death. 
But Saul said, no one should be put to death today, for this day the Lord has, given, has rescued Israel. The point being, do you remember at his, when he was being anointed at Mizpah, after he was anointed, some of the folks despised him and mocked him. And uh, so now the, the, the folks in Israel didn't really rally to Saul's side so much after that. Saul could have probably rallied them, but he didn't. But now they love him. He's just rallied the troops. He's given the Israelites a great victory over the Ammonites. And uh, so now the people are really thrilled with this man as their king. And so they say, you know those guys who despised you and, and ridiculed you? Let's bring them out and kill them. And what did Saul say? No, let's not do that. So the point being, and these, the point I'm trying to make in all this is it, that he began well. He demonstrated humility, demonstrated courage and wisdom and nobility. He could have gotten vengeance at those guys who mocked him and ridiculed him when he was anointed. But he chose not to. That's good. Then he turned bad, and it didn't take long. In fact, he uh, turned uh, bad within two years. It was in the second year of his reign that uh, they were doing their sort of annual war with the Philistines. As you read through the books of the Old Testament prior to the time, uh, well, pretty much throughout all the Old Testament, you find the Israelites were constantly having trouble with the Philistines. The judges had trouble with them. Saul had trouble with them. And so what happened was the Philistines were encamped at Michmash, and the Israelites were encamped at Gilgal. And uh, they were going, getting ready to do battle. And uh, Samuel told Saul, as he was on his way to Gilgal to gather the troops there at Gilgal, that he should not go to war against the Philistines until he, Samuel, had come and offered up a sacrifice to Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Fine, Saul said. Samuel said, I'll be there in seven days. The seventh day came, still no Samuel. Saul said, uh, I can't wait any longer. The troops are getting restless. I'll offer up the sacrifice. So he had the sacrifice offered. That was a great sin of impatience, and because of that, he lost the kingdom. Saul remained at Gilgal, you read about it, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up burnt offerings. Just as Saul finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. And Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, Michmash was right here, just a couple of three miles away from Gilgal, and that you did not come at the set time and the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the Lord's favor, so I felt compelled to offer the burnt offerings. You acted foolishly, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. This was the first major sin on Saul's part. Now, this is kind of difficult for us to get a handle on because we're looking at this situation. We're saying, wait a minute. All he did was jump the gun on the sacrifice. And Samuel says, because of that, you've lost the kingdom. He could have been not just the first king of Israel. His dynasty could have been the eternal dynasty. The Lord Jesus Christ would have been a descendant, not of David, but of Saul, and when Jesus Christ rules during the millennial reign, he would be sitting not on the throne of David, but on the throne of Saul. But he lost it because he jumped the gun. And the next question you would say, ask is this. Wait a minute. Saul lost the kingdom because he just offered the sacrifice a little bit ahead of time. David committed murder and adultery. Not in that order, adultery murder. 
and he didn't lose the kingdom. What, what's going on here? This is what's going on. Saul lost the kingdom for his impatience because fundamentally he didn't care about God. He frankly didn't care about God's command. Saul was a man after the people's heart. David was a man after God's heart. You look at the sins of Saul, and you compare them with the sins of David, and you say, wait a minute, David seems so much worse. Only, only picking on a few incidents in his life. It just doesn't seem to make sense. But the sense is deeper than what's external. The simple truth is, Saul really didn't care about God. That doesn't mean he didn't worship God. God, you know, God. Jehovah was the God of Israel, and he sort of gave him nodding approval from time to time. But fundamentally, he didn't really care. All he cared about was what he could get out of God, not how he could serve God. David, on the other hand, blew it big time on a few occasions. But in his heart, he had a passion, passionate love for God. There's the enormous difference. Now, you keep that in mind the next time you blast some brother because he fell into egregious sinful behavior. I'm tying it into what's going on. You know, there, there we, we, we have in our ranks lots of, Sinners saved by grace, don't we? And woe be to the man who falls into sexual immorality. We'll nail that poor guy for the rest of his life. And I want to say, wait a minute. Let's back off a minute. Meanwhile, there are a bunch of people out there in the ranks who don't get two hoots about God. Them we like, but they haven't fallen into sexual immorality. You understand where I'm going with this? you got to look at the Bible to get a handle on how we're supposed to live and examine one another's conduct. Saul lost the kingdom because he, he not wasn't just, the, it was more than impatience. It was more than just jumping the gun. He just flat didn't care. So God made a command, whoopee, I don't have time for God's commands. That would have never been David's attitude. In fact, when David fell into sin, he was appalled at himself for having fallen into sin. You see the enormous difference here? And I think God gives us these examples because he wants us to draw lessons from them. In any event, Saul sinned by being impatient. Now, a lot of folks think that his sin was assuming the priestly office. I've, and actually, I've, I've heard that taught for years. And early in my Christian life, I taught that. Ripped my tongue out. It's wrong. Folks generally look at this situation and say, Saul's sin was he assumed for himself the role of a priest by offering up the sacrifice. But that wasn't the case. We know from another passage, a scripture, in 1 Samuel 14, that he actually had a priest with him in his entourage. So almost certainly Paul Saul would have had him offer up the sacrifice. That's point one. Point two is other non-Levites offered up sacrifices and never got into trouble. Gideon offered up a sacrifice, Manoah, David, Solomon. And you're saying, they didn't get into trouble, so why should Saul? He was not assuming the priestly office. Now, at this point in Israel's history, it's, try, it's a little bit difficult to figure out exactly what's going on with all this sacrificial business. We know that once the temple was built and they had an established priesthood, all sacrifices were supposed to be offered up where? At Jerusalem at the temple. That's the reason today Orthodox Jews are crying out for a temple. One of the reasons when they have Passover, they can't have Passover lamb. They just have a bone reminding them of it because there's only one place that that lamb can be sacrificed, and that's in Jerusalem at the temple in Jerusalem. So once the temple was built by Solomon, uh, 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 Solomon and they had an established priesthood, all sacrifices had to be offered up at the temple. And actually, you get the sense that God really wanted all the sacrifices offered up at the tabernacle prior to that time, but he seems to have been a little loose on it. Because we know that Gideon offered up a sacrifice. Manoah Manor was the father of Samson. David offered up sacrifices. Solomon offered up sacrifices. And they didn't get into trouble. So the point I'm trying to make here is when we talk about Saul's sin, it was not a sin of assuming for himself the office of a priest, which is generally taught, but it was simply being impatient. Saul's real sin was, as I just pointed out, he didn't care. He didn't care. And God knew his heart. He could have waited, but he just didn't care. So God's unhappy with it. So what? David, I promise you, would never have that attitude. 
So Saul turned bad. He saw his first great sin was the sin of impatience. His second sin was he refused to confess his sin. When David was confronted with his sins, he, he, would, he would admit them and repent. Saul always made lame excuses. And you read through his excuses, you think you're, sound, you're, you're listening to a modern-day politician. I mean, every, it was always somebody else's fault. It wasn't my fault we jumped the gun. The guys were getting ready to scatter, and anyway, I, you know, what's the big deal? He just simply wouldn't confess his sin. So his first sin, the one got him in trouble and one lost the kingdom for him, was the sin of impatience when he was at Gilgal waiting for Samuel to come. He refused to wait, and so he just offered up the sacrifice, and uh, he lost the kingdom because of that. And Saul refused to confess his sin. That was the second sin. And then finally it was uh, his failure to destroy the Amalekites. In the 20th year of his reign, Saul was told by Samuel that God had instructed Samuel to tell Saul to go down to southern Israel, below the southern boundaries of Israel, into the Sinai, and take on the Amalekites. The Amalekites were a nomadic tribal people who lived in the Sinai south of Israel. And 400 years earlier, when the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness, the Amalekites had attacked them and mistreated them. God had given them time to repent. They did not repent, so now was judgment time. So God told Sam, uh, Samuel to go and talk to Saul and tell Saul, get the army together, go down to southern Israel and destroy the Amalekites, and I want you to destroy them completely. Wipe them out totally and completely. We read about it in the 15th chapter of 1 Samuel. Samuel said to Saul, I am the Lord, the one the Lord sent to anoint you, anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. These are instructions from God. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go, attack the Amalekites, and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men, women, children, infants, cattle, sheep, camels, donkeys. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites. But Saul and the army spared Agag, he was the king, and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and the lambs, everything that was good. <laughs> These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. So if it was lame and diseased, that they killed. If it was nice and fat, they kept it. When Samuel met with Saul, because Samuel always came down to check on Saul, he came down and said, Saul, how did it go? Oh, I did it very well. Did you destroy every? I destroyed everybody. Everything is destroyed. It's all taken care of. Then Samuel said, gee, I hear the bleeding of sheep and the lowing of cattle. How did that happen? Well, Samuel said, Saul said, uh, listen, if I killed everything, the people would be unhappy with me. Notice how these lame excuses, don't use them before God. He knows, folks. You know, the people would have been unhappy with me. But this is, this is, this is the one that nails it. Actually, the reason I kept some of them alive, Samuel, was because I wanted to use them as sacrifices to the Lord. <laughs> Woe be to the man who uses a religious excuse to explain away his bad behavior. This is what he's doing. He kept them for himself. We all know that. He knew that. Samuel knew that. God certainly knew that. But he got caught. So what did he say? Well, the people would have been happy with Don't blame me. Don't blame me. He would fit into this age real well. We're all victims. Don't blame me. Don't blame me. Blame the people. In any way, I wanted to honor God by being disobedient. I don't know quite how he figures that, but he believed it. And that's when Samuel replied with a, with a passage of Scripture you've heard many times. It's worth repeating. But Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the verse, voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. 
For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. But you have rejected the word of the Lord, and he has rejected you as king. These are these uh, again, he's repeating what in fact he had said 18 years earlier when he got on Saul's case because Saul had not waited for him at Gilgal to come and offer up the sacrifice. Now some additional notes on King Saul. God rejected Saul and selected David. David's throne will be David's throne will be eternal throne and it is today. It could have been Saul's throne, but it's David's. God gave the Holy Spirit to David. God took the Holy Spirit from Saul and God gave Saul an evil spirit. Some people have trouble with this, but this is what it says. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went to Ramah. Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Not only did God reject King Saul as king of Israel, God selected David. And the Holy Spirit that had indwelt Saul came and indwelt David. And then God sent an evil spirit to indwell Saul, to torment him. That was the punishment for having rejected the God who had given him. Do you, do you realize the, the tremendous honor he had given Do you realize the honor God had laid on Saul? It's pretty hard to think of an honor on planet Earth any greater than the, Saul, than, than, than the honor of being selected by God to be king of God's people, to be the one who would establish an eternal throne, to be the one through whom the Messiah, Jesus, would come. Saul could have had it all. His could have been an eternal dynasty. He could have been the grandfather of the Messiah, Jesus. You know what he thought about all of this? I don't care. Whew. This is the difference between Saul and David. David valued spiritual things. Saul just didn't. He just didn't much care whether God liked it or not. He preferred God be on his side than not be on his side. He certainly wanted God's help. He'd offer up some sacrifices. But fundamentally, he just didn't care about God. And that's the reason God really rejected him. So God rejected Saul, selected David. Saul spent the last six or eight years of his life. He had a 32-year ministry. He spent the last six or eight years chasing after David. Now, David was about 15 when he was anointed. Uh, probably a short time after that, he got to know Saul. Saul had a 32-year reign. And uh, David won't become king until he's 30 years old. So he's got 15 years of, of being the anointed king and waiting. After several years, he, because he was a good harp player, he was invited into Saul's court to play the harp to soothe Saul's tormented soul. And why was Saul's soul tormented? He had the evil spirit. And the evil spirit would come on Saul. They would call David to play the harp. A little later on, when the troops were uh, doing battle again with the Philistines and Goliath came out, and taunted the Israelites, David appeared again as a teenage boy. And uh, the troops and the seasoned soldiers wouldn't take on Goliath, but David would take on Goliath and killed him. And people really liked David, and so he was sort of, Saul knew he better bring this, this, this hot shot into the, uh, the, the uh, royal court. And he did, and they liked him, but Saul became jealous of him. And so for the next... Uh, 10, 12 years, you're going to see David being a good side of Saul, the bad side of Saul, good side of Saul, bad side of Saul. He gets a little monotonous after a while. Saul wanted to kill David, then he would fail to kill David, and then he would be stricken with guilt and apologize to David. It was just, he, he, was, he was a mess. So some additional, he rejected, God rejected Saul, selected David. Saul spent years trying to kill David, the last six or eight years doing that. Saul ended up committing suicide on Mount Gilboa, and that ended the reign of Saul. Very sad. After he died, his son Ishbosheth was made king in the north of Israel, um, and David in the south. So David is 30 years old. He was anointed when he was 15. We'll be talking more about that in a moment. And uh, the northern kingdom wasn't quite ready 
keep you have to think of Israel as 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 a as this sort of loose collection of tribes, and the northern tribes uh, wanted to go with their guy, the son of Saul. So they made Ishbosheth king, but he was kind of pathetic. Actually, Abner, Abner, Saul's general, became the real power behind the throne. David was from the tribe of Judah, which is the southern tribe. They went ahead and made David their king. So for the first, after Saul died, for the next seven and a half years, David was king in the south, Ishbosheth in the north, and then finally everyone decided David is it and made David king. And he remained king until he was 70 years old. So he ruled in Israel for 40 years. Saul's son, Ishbosheth, were just a few. Some additional notes on Saul. Saul was a poor, is, was a, was a, as a poor, wow, sometimes I don't pay attention to my notes, was a poor leader. He was capricious. He was foolish. He just didn't do a good job. It's not enough to have the jobs. You've got to know how to do And you'll find as you read through the life of Saul, he just didn't do a good job. He often made really foolish mistakes. And his second biggest problem is he was poor in character. He just didn't have integrity. And finally, he had a poor relationship with God. This was his biggest problem. Israel needed a king who walked with Jehovah. And in Saul, they didn't have that man. All right, these are the major events in the book of 1 Samuel. It began with Hannah crying out to God for a child, and then we, we read about Samuel growing up with Eli in the tabernacle, then we just talked about the Philistines capturing the Ark of the Covenant, and then we talk about Israel crying out for a king and Samuel anointing Saul king. We're now working our way through the reign of King Saul. We just finished an evaluation of King Saul, and let's spend just a few minutes talking about the anointing of David. After Saul's failure, God had David anointed, and this was probably about midpoint in Saul's 32-year reign. The Lord said to Samuel, so David's going to be about 15 years old. Saul will continue reigning for another 15, 16 years. David is just a boy, probably about 15 years old, and he's sort of king in waiting. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Bethlehem is about six miles south of Jerusalem. David was, as I just pointed out, about 15 years old when he was anointed. He was born in 1040 B.C. He was anointed at age 15, approximately. He began running from Saul when he was 22 to 25. It's sometimes hard to be certain of the age of David and some of these others when certain events took place. He became king of Judah at age 30. And remember, Ishbosheth was in the, in the, in, ruling in the north and David in the south. And then at 37 and a half, he took over as king of the entire country. He died at age 70. He ruled Israel for 40 years. And he was truly remarkable man. And that's an understatement. He was a man after God's own heart. We're told that repeatedly, and that's sort of, he's known by two things. He was known as the great shepherd king, which is a tremendous compliment. Not the warrior king, the shepherd king, even though he was a great warrior. And secondly, he was, he's also known as a man after God's own heart. To King Saul, Samuel said, you acted foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God, the, the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Now, what does it mean to have a heart like God's heart? To begin with, and most importantly, to have a heart like God's heart is to want what God wants. David wanted what God wants. Saul couldn't have cared less. Know the difference? You look at the sins of David, I'm going to keep emphasizing this. His sins, from a human point of view, were far greater than Saul's. I mean, a little impatience. People say, what's the big deal? But this is the problem with the secular man mind. You look at it and you say, what's the I mean, Saul, it's a little Mickey Mouse thing over here. So he kept a guy and some nice sheep alive and lied about it. David, murderer and, and adultery. The difference was Saul didn't care. David did care. He had a heart after God's own heart. He wanted what God wanted. 
David wanted the same things God wants. And this is what we need to have. He was burdened with what burdened God's heart. He loved righteousness the way God's heart loves righteousness. He hated sin the way God's heart hates sin. And he was a servant just like God was a servant. To want what God wants, to have a heart like God's heart, is to want what God wants, is to be burdened by what burdens God's heart, to love righteousness the way God's heart loves righteousness, to hate sin the way God's heart hates sin, to be a servant like God's heart, like God's heart is a servant's heart. And I find this as I'm growing older. I've grown to hate sin more and more and more. So in little ways, God has given me a heart like that. Not like David's, please don't misunderstand me. <laughs> but haven't you noticed? I know, I think intellectually when I first got saved over 40 years ago, you know, I, I agreed that sin was bad and righteousness was good. And I wanted to avoid sin and embrace righteousness. I'm sure many of you feel the same way. But it wasn't until I, God started working on my heart that I really grew to hate sin. I don't think I hated sin so much. Oh, I hated murder and theft and rape and the really big stuff. And abortion, I mean, it's not hard to hate those things. But as I grew as a Christian, I began to find myself more disgusted with the world of sin. I've grown more and more disgusted with the sin of my own heart, more and more disgusted with the sinful thought. In fact, sin is becoming more and more repugnant to me. And as you grow in the Lord, that should happen to you. And you know what? I've noticed that. We're, we're living in an age that's growing rapidly more and more sinful. We're growing, we live in an age in which sin is ruling the world. It's not that the world's ever been all that righteous, don't misunderstand. But you find in this country that had this thin Judeo-Christian veneer, it's growing more and more wicked. And I find Christians who are mature in the Lord and have hearts like the Lord are finding that to be more and more repugnant. I pick this up in conversations. We read the newspaper, we read, we read about the same-sex marriage and, and this whole problem with, 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 with uh, bathrooms. And, and then we find not only that uh, as a society turning against the Judeo-Christian morals, but they're attacking those who stand against them. And you find this is disgusting. That's a heart like God's heart. I promise you, Saul wouldn't have cared. David found sin to be disgusting. To have a heart like God's heart is to want what God wants, is to be burdened by what burdens God's heart, is to love righteousness the way God loved righteousness, to hate sin the way God hates sin, to be a servant. David never stopped being a servant. I think that's the reason God had him trained out there in the hills of Judea where he tended his father's sheep. David was given more space in the Bible than anyone other than Jesus. Fourteen chapters of the Bible are devoted to Abraham, eleven chapters to Jacob, thirteen chapters to Joseph, ten to Elijah, and look at that, sixty-six chapters devoted to David. And I'm not counting the 73 Psalms written by David. Nor am I counting the 600 times in the Old Testament that his name is mentioned and the 300 times in the New Testament. 30 times in the New Testament, excuse me. God thought very highly of David. He was given more space in the Bible than anyone other than Jesus. David was many things. He was a shepherd. And he never got over being a shepherd. The, the, the mantra for a shepherd is take care of the sheep. Take care of the sheep. Don't be a prima donna. Take care of the sheep. I'm sure when he came home from the hills with the sheep, his father said, how are the sheep? His father didn't say, how are you? <laughs> well, maybe his father did, but I get the sense his father didn't. His father thought he was sort of insignificant. The fact is, when Samuel came to, uh, to Bethlehem to anoint the sons of one of the sons of Jesse, God didn't tell him which one ahead of time. Uh, Jesse brought, remember the seven oldest sons in? And uh, Samuel said, none of them. And then, uh, is there anyone left? Yeah, well, this is that insignificant one out in the field taking care of the sheep. And uh, that was the one. He was a shepherd. He never got over the, the requirement of shepherd was take care of the sheep. He was a poet. He wrote 73 psalms. He was a musician. 
He played the harp so well it could soothe Saul's tormented soul. He was a great warrior. Of course, the, we're introduced to him as being a warrior uh, when he took on Goliath, but we were already told at the same moment that with not high-powered rifle, but with whatever tools he had, a sling or maybe a sword or whatever, he managed to kill a bear and a lion that attacked his flock. That's pretty courageous. And he, now he's, he's still a teenager. He took on Goliath and all the seasoned soldiers wouldn't do it. He was courageous, courageous to the point that most people might think he was foolhardy. He was a great, and he was a great general. His guys would die for him. They would die for him. I remember one occasion he was fighting the Philistines. You'll read about this when we get to, to 2 Samuel. And uh, just, he was just exhausted. It's one of those days, that, you know, you have bad days. Apparently he'd had a bad week or two. And it was hot and he was thirsty. And he says, oh, I would give anything for a drink of water from that well outside of Bethlehem where he grew up. He wasn't suggesting somebody go get it. He just he was reflecting on that whole package of having lived in Bethlehem and, and drinking fresh water from the well and, and it comforting his soul. Uh, a couple of his soldiers went through the Philistine lines to get him a glass of water from that well. Now, you don't command men to do that. They did it because they loved him. And I promise you, soldiers don't love bad generals. They don't love bad generals. He was a courageous warrior. You can be sure he was in the front of the lines, and he was smart. He was smart, smart not only a warrior, he was a smart politician. When he became king, Israel was a mess. You had these 12 disparate tribes. They weren't getting along. It was, they had no centralized government. They had no capital city. Uh, Saul sort of lived in the hometown of Gibeah. He just stayed there. David captured the Jebusites and made Jerusalem the capital. He formed a strong centralized government. The tabernacle, bits and pieces were scattered everywhere. He brought, the, brought it to, to, to Jerusalem and established the priesthood, set everything up so his son Solomon could build the temple. So he, he basically got their, system, their religious system squared away. He got their government squared away. He went and conquered all of the surrounding Gentile nations, made them vassal states. We talk about vassal state, which meaning he conquered them and they had to pay taxes, a good deal. Those, those surrounding Gentile nations were now helping out to fill the treasury of Israel. Now, he didn't do that accidentally. God obviously blessed him, but God made him smart. He really made Israel into a nation. And as a result, we view him as Israel's greatest king other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And David's character was his greatest accomplishment. He was a man of righteousness, integrity. He was a man of great loyalty to his friends. Loyalty is a wonderful trait. It is esteemed in the scriptures. We need to be loyal to one another. It doesn't mean we excuse one another's bad behavior. We need to be loyal to one another. Loyalty is a virtue. And David was incredibly loyal to his friends. He was incredibly merciful. When he became king, he was extremely kind to the family of Saul, even though Saul had spent six or eight years trying to kill him. When he became king, he was gracious. To be loyal and gracious is a virtue that we're, it's hard to find in some of our politicians. And he was also a man of great passion. I'm sure if he lived today, he'd probably be a Pentecostal. <laughs> Calvinists eat your heart out. He was a passionate man. When they brought the, the, the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, I, I hope they videotaped it. I can't wait to see it. I really do. I've thought about it a thousand times, maybe more than a thousand times. David is dancing. He's excited. I listen to some of these folks, and they're just, I, I, all I can think of was, uh, oh, the, 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 the British preacher. What was his name? Spurgeon. Spurgeon looked at the clergymen in England in his day and said, most of these guys should be funeral directors, not preachers. <laughs> They're so dour, so unhappy, so miserable. He said, we ought to be the happiest people in the world. Or oh, I'm happy. I got the joy of the Lord in my heart. <laughs> Give me a break. We should be the happiest people in the world. We, you're, you, we just went, you remember those blessings we went through this morning? Is that exciting? You're going to get two more doses in the next two sermons. We should be thrilled to be children of God, to be blessed 
by having been chosen by God to be members of his family. He has this glorious future for us. He's paid for our sins. We're wretched, filthy people. He's covered it. David understood all of that. He really did. He didn't know about the cross yet, but he knew God had covered his sins. In fact, he wrote about it. Paul picked up on it in the book of Romans. He was excited. He loved God. To walk with God was thrilling. So when they brought the the Ark of the Covenant in, he knew God dwelt between the golden cherubim. He was dancing. He was thrilled. His wife, Michael, was ashamed. She never bore a child after that. God was not happy about it. And in addition to that, he was pat- read his poetry. Read the 73 Psalms. His excitement exudes from the pages of Psalms. It comes out everywhere. So he wasn't just a dour, smart guy who was sitting and a strategist. He was a man who was excited. He was a shepherd, a poet, a musician, a warrior. He's smart. Israel's great king. He was a man of righteousness and integrity, of great loyalty, a man of great passion. He was excited about being a child of God. David was also sadly a man of flaws. A murderer and an adulterer. He was a loving father, but indulgent. He never really got the, f- the family thing together. Um, he just never did. I don't doubt for a second he, he, that, he, uh, that he loved his children. He loved his children passionately, but he never disciplined them. He just never could get the family thing down. So if you're looking ha- on some examples of how to be a parent, don't turn to David. If you're looking for an example of passion, he's the guy to. Being passionate for God, he's the guy. Courage, he's the guy. Mercy and grace, he's the guy. Raising kids, no, he's not the guy. David was a man who made no excuses for his sinful behavior. Unlike Saul, David did not excuse his sinful behavior. He confessed and repented. David's family did not recognize him as a remarkable man. I've already talked about that. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So they sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy. David was a redhead. So I don't know why I've got all these illustrations of David with brown hair. I want to say, if you read the scriptures, Mac, he was, he was a redhead. If you ever notice, a lot of redheads in Israel, a lot of Jews are redheads. All descendants of David. No, I don't. I like to think so, though. So he sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise up and anoint him. He's the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. It left Saul... And the evil spirit came on Saul. The word youngest right here is the word katan in Hebrew. It means small, young, and insignificant. Well, the insignificant one is out. That's the reason I didn't bring him in. Well, God didn't think he was insignificant. Quick review, and we'll close. King Saul began well. He demonstrated humility. He demonstrated courage and wisdom. He demonstrated humility, nobility. He didn't go out and attack those guys who had been nasty to him. King Saul turned bad. He sinned by being impatient. He sinned by refusing to confess his sins. And he sinned when he failed to destroy the Amalekites. Some additional notes on King Saul. God rejected Saul and selected David. Saul spent years trying to kill David. This is one of the saddest chapters in anybody's life. He could have just saved the last six or eight years of his reign. He spent them in total frustration trying to kill David because he was jealous. Jealousy is a vile and disgusting trait. And when you see it in individuals, you can see it in churches, it's disgusting. And it killed him. It ruined his life. Jealousy. Saul spent years trying to kill David. He ended up committing suicide on Mount Gilboa. And as I point out, Ishbosheth, his son, was made king for just a few years. David, on the other hand, was an exceptional king. After Saul's failure, God had David anointed. He was about 15 years old when he was anointed. He was a truly remarkable man. David was a man after God's own heart. He wanted what God wanted. David was given more space in the Bible than anyone other than Jesus. He was many things, a shepherd, a poet, a musician, a warrior, smart. He was Israel's greatest king, but his character was his greatest accomplishment. Character reigns. Pay attention to the next election. Character reigns but you don't have any choices.
David was a man of flaws. He was a murderer and an adulterer. He was a loving but indulgent father. Don't look to him if you're looking for an example on how to raise your kids. He just blew it. He was a man who made no excuses for his sins. Unlike Saul, David did not excuse his sinful behavior. He would confess and repent. David's family did not recognize him as being a remarkable man. David was recognized by God as being a remarkable man, and that's all that counts. And with that, we'll close. Father, we love you. We worship you. We thank you for David and men like him. What great examples they give us to follow. I pray we will. I pray more than anything else that we'll be men and women who will have hearts like yours. What a great way to imitate David. I pray we will want what you want. In Jesus' name we pray.